Okay, we're recording. We're recording. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Very good, Aaron Shabbat. We are in the midst of the uh, seven haftarot of consolation. The Shiva the Nechemata. We read last week already Shavat Nachamu. So we read the all of them are from the Novi Yeshayo. All the uh, commentators that have looked at the uh, order of the seven Haftarot comment on the fact that there is a dialogue here. There's a discussion between God, so to speak, and between the Jewish people about their relationship. Uh, it begins uh, with uh, Shabbat Chazon, which foretells the Hurban, the destruction of the Jewish people. And then immediately there's Shabbat Nachamu, which uh, is meant to comfort us. And then this week's after begins on Ochi, on Ochi. No, I'm sorry. The, the, and this week's after is when the Jewish people complain. The Jewish people say, God forgot about us. In other words, in Shabbos Nachamu, the Bon Shalom says, I'm here to comfort you. I'm here to console you. I'm here to promise you better days. The Jewish people respond, so to speak, you know, words are cheap. But the fact of the matter is, you deserted me. Hashem Shrehuni in the Rabboni Shalom forgot me. So again, it's a conversation not to each other, but past each other, so to speak. The Jewish people complain because we all know, for instance, if a person, God forbid, undergoes a personal disappointment or tragedy, whether it be illness or financial or family or whatever, and then the person is able to get out of it. He doesn't forget what happened to him. <laughs> the fact that uh, now he is successful again uh, does not erase from his memory or from his consciousness the fact that he didn't have bread to eat. So, therefore, the Jewish people say to the Rabboni Shalom, Nachamu, Nachamu, Ami, right? Be comforted. Good. But that doesn't do it. Thank you very much. But what about what went before? So, is there any true comfort to consolation? that is able, so to speak, to change the mindset, that is strong enough to a uh, great extent to erase the pain of what went before. You know, there's a, the book of Eov in Tanakh records for us, it's in the Gemara, who Eov was, 
or whether even there was such a person, that the whole thing is a metaphor. But in any event, in the, as it is written in the uh, book, in the Sefer Riov, here's a very wealthy man who has a big family and is very well respected and is known to be a good and righteous person. And everything is taken away from him. His family, his wealth, his standing, his health, everything. And at the end of the book, he is restored. He has again another family, as numerous as the previous one. His wealth is restored. His status is restored. But he'll never get over the fact of what happened to him. That's the, the message of the book, the dialogue that Eov has with heaven. He feels that he was treated unfairly. That the, uh, the judgment, uh, the test, the challenge of heaven was not justified. Avram Avinu raises the same problem when it comes to the city of Zdom. The Holy Shalom says, Is it possible that I will not reveal to Avram my intention here? Anshay Zdom, Roim, Vachatoim, Lashem, Maod. Such an evil city. They perpetrate such terrible acts. So I tell Avram they're going to be destroyed. Avram's reaction is a strange one. He says to the Rabboni Shalom, Shofet kol ha'aretz lo yasem ishpat. The judge of the world will not do ultimate justice here. In Stone, there may be good people. Are you going to destroy the righteous to get just to be together with the evil? And therefore he negotiates, so to speak, with God. Maybe we'll find 50 people, 45, 40, 30, 20, 10. The end they don't find. And Zdom is destroyed. When Zdom is destroyed, so Lot is saved because of Avram Avinu. So there's a trauma that happens here. The trauma is to Lot, to his daughters, and to Avram Avinu as well. And because of that, throughout history, uh, the attitude towards Moab and B'nai Ammon has to be different. It's not the same as to the people of Zdom themselves. So even though terrible things happened, and even though Lot was spared, Lot is a victim also. And that, in essence, is what the Jewish people are telling the Rabboni Shalom. That's what the Haftorah comes to tell us. Zion says, the Rabboni Shalom has forsaken me. 
It's obvious that he has not forsaken me. You're still here. He survived the Churban. You're, so you're all still here. And all the words of the Choma that appeared in last week's Haftorah are fulfilled. And yet the Jewish people feel traumatized. They feel that they have not been spared. And therefore, that's why they say, Vatomer Tzion Azovani Hashem, Hashem Shechuni. Sometimes things happen in life, an experience that's very negative, and somehow we get over it. But that experience is never expunged from our memory. We never forget that it happened. And therefore, no matter how reassured we are, we still feel vulnerable, and we still feel that we're in danger, and that we're this much away from again experiencing such a trauma, such a tragedy. And if you think about it, that's really the story of Jewish history throughout the millennia. One crisis to the next. One persecution to the next. And the Jewish people as a people, as a faith, as a symbol, survive it all. So we survive uh, the Crusades, and we survive uh, 1648, and we survive, uh, we survive the Holocaust. We survive. But each one of the tragedies leaves an imprint on the psychology of the Jewish people. So that after each one of them, they are less secure than they were before. You know, we, uh, we have a slogan, never again. Only people who uh, believe that uh, it can happen again say never again. Nobody else says it. But to us, it's never again, because it's again. <laughs> Look. Every 50 years, every 100 years, every two centuries, never again. So that's the essence of this week's Haftorah. That complaint of the Jewish people the insecurity of the Jewish people. Now, insecurity drives us to a number of different responses. One response is, who has to be Jewish? Why should we bother with the whole thing? There's nothing to be gained. I remember that... Uh, I had a student uh, who came from the Soviet Union, and uh, somehow <clears throat> his parents enrolled him. He was a very bright young man. His parents enrolled him in the yeshiva, even though the parents were not not only not observant, they uh, they they were Jewish only by uh, the fact that the NKVD stamped their passport that way. And uh, the, uh, the young man uh, was not circumcised. Not only did he not have a bar mitzvah, he didn't have a brit milah. And we didn't know what to do about it. The rabbi and the faculty, what do we, 
we talked to the I talk, was talked to the parents and we explained that we did and, 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 and we told them uh, said this is America and you know they have nothing to worry about it did not help they refused can't force people to do anything. So it was the week before he was graduating. He lives here in Israel now, by the way. And uh, the week before, the father came to me, and he said that they had talked it over, and they agreed that he should uh, undergo circumcision. And he said, uh, because it became clear to him, he said, that after he had gone to the yeshiva for high school for four years, and that he was such a good student, and he knew so much Torah, that it was incongruous that he did not have a brit milah. So I was uh, naturally very uh, satisfied. I don't know what word to use. So, but I did ask him, I said, why did you object so until now? He said, I want to tell you that when the Germans came to our town, they had all the men take off their clothes, and anyone that was circumcised was shot on the spot. So I determined then. that if I ever had a son, I would not allow him to be circumcised because he said they come back again, you know. Anybody that's circumcised, they'll shoot him on the spot. I was, I was uh, you can imagine I was taken aback by that because there's no good answer to that. So, but I pursued it. I said, so then why now? Now, now you're going to do it. So he says, well, he says before he would have been shot, but he would never have known why he was being shot. And now that he has this education and he has this way of life, he at least knows why they shoot him, so it's worth it. Be shot. I, I thought to myself, so that's one reaction. I understand the father for the first time. I understand him completely. He's not an atheist. He's, not, he's telling you a practical thing. They're going to come to shoot, and then he, he's not going to be able to get out of it. So this reaction is uh, simply, uh, since I don't believe never again to be true, and I have no protection to guarantee never again, in spite of all of the uh, uh, boastful claims that we have, how strong we are, how influential we are, how advanced the world is, etc., etc. Deep down in our hearts, we know it can happen again. So we give up. It's not worth it. That's one reaction. I had a Jew that was an uh, employee of the OU, and he was a, uh, he was a great expert on uh, shkita, on ritual slaughter. 
and he uh, was our uh, supervisor over uh, the shochtim and the chicken plants and the meat plants, etc. Which is a difficult, difficult job. It's a dirty, smelly, noisy job. It's one of the most interesting contrasts is that according to Jewish law, in order to be a shochet, one has to be a superior moral person. Doesn't say that about a rabbi. Uh, maybe it's because the rabbi wrote the book, but it doesn't say it. It doesn't say it about anybody. But it says it's about a shochet. She has to be Yerei Hashem Mirabim. It's to be an obviously God-fearing person because we're trusting him with something that we cannot check. We cannot know uh, the condition of the knife that he used. We cannot know whether his hand was steady. We cannot know any of that. So we have a great deal of trust in one person, and 99% of the time we don't know who the person is even. So this uh, Jew was a uh, <clears throat> supervisor, so to speak, of our shochtim. And uh, I worked very closely with him. I knew him very well. He was uh, an outstanding human being. Now, he was in the Shoah. He was already a shochet when he was 20 years old. So he told me once, I'm sorry, they never talked about it, and I never begin the, the conversation about it, because uh, you never know what box you're going to open. But the one, I always found that Purim was the time that people spoke to you. In the midst of all the levity, Purim was, uh, that's, I always felt that's what Chazal meant, that it's Yom Kippurim, Yom Kippur, because well, like we reveal ourselves. So he said to me, I was for two years in the camps before I escaped, and I was with the partisans, etc. He said, Rabbi Wine, you have to believe me. He said, I never ate a piece of non-kosher meat. I cannot tell you the other food that I ate, what it was, but I never took any meat. He said, because I knew that when I got out of this, I wanted to still be a shochet. And I could not, in good conscience, attempt to be a shochet if I had eaten non-kosher meat. So I want you to know that. So here is the other side of the coin. The man doubles down. He's in the middle of hell. They have nothing to eat. They're being worked to death. He only survives because he's 20 or 21 years old. So he's not going to eat any meat because he's going to be a shochet yet. He's not going to let it destroy him. So that's a remarkable psychology. So I understand him also. I understand what drives him, where his faith lies. I had another Jew, and I know you love, uh, uh, I tell all these bovamices. <laughs> So when I was in Miami Beach, it was so, and it, 
then it was still closer to the Shoah. So I had many, many survivors that I knew later, and actually, as time took its toll, it's less and less. Today, it's almost impossible to find. But uh, so was a Jew there who was a very, very wealthy Jew. He had a home in Miami Beach, and he had a home in Florida, and he had a home in Jerusalem. He had a, he, he vacationed on the Riviera. <laughs> so he would come every poor and bring Shalach Monas to me and talk 10, 15 minutes. So he asked me once, he said, aren't you interested how I survived? So I said, I'm very interested, but it's, uh, you know, uh, it's not, it's not polite for me to, you know, it's your, uh, I don't want to awaken within you, uh, Scenes and memories that uh, that have nothing to do with me. He said, "No, no, I'll tell you how." He said, "In 1938, he said I was in Budapest. I was a very wealthy man. I had a family. On a whim, I went on a trip to Jerusalem." He said that my family were not Zionists. In fact, they belonged to a Hasidic group that was well known for its anti-Zionism. Because he said, I went to Jerusalem and I had money. He said, a person has money, he doesn't know what to do with it much. Burns a hole in your pocket. So he said that a real estate broker showed me an apartment in 1938. Could have bought all of Rechavia for, uh, you know, the famous. And he said, I bought the apartment. And I had an architect uh, draw plans. Uh, I would do... Uh, she puts him, I would uh, rebuild the apartment to uh, my standards, my wife and I. Then came uh, 19, so from 1938 to 1944, the Jews in Hungary were not really touched by the Germans because the Hungarians were still in control. And only in uh, the spring of 1944, the, the Germans take over completely and begin the liquidation of Hungarian Jewry. So from uh, March 1944 to the end of the war, 60% of Hungarian Jewry was destroyed. They were all sent to Auschwitz, to Birkenau, one, two, three. He said, I was sent to a work camp. He said, in the work camp, we uh, slept on wooden slats, the barracks. And we had uh, two uh, bowls of soup a day for food. And every day, uh, the guy that was sleeping next to you, you got up in the morning, he wasn't there anymore. So he said to me, Rabbi Wine, you know, how did I survive that? So he said, because in my mind, every night, I furnished my apartment in Jerusalem. And I thought to myself that the profundity of that thought. So that's really what the Jewish people are saying in this week's Haftorah. But Omer Tzion Azavani Hashem Vashem Shechechuni. You were in the work camp.
but we're furnishing the apartment. So you have this mixture of emotions which dominates the Sheva Nenechamuta, the seven Haftorahs of comfort. So that we're not really comforted. At the end, all the questions remain. But somehow we now have the means of survival and means of survival eventually in life, both physically and mentally, as well as spiritually, uh, give us the ability to continue and to prosper and to be successful. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Thank you for coming. We'll see you next week, God willing. Thank you. I don't. Die alone.